attached to his downfall. It's the gorgeous Gale himself, Jack Doyle, a legend lost. Backstage at London's White City Stadium, Jack Doyle prepared for the fight of his life, the British heavyweight boxing title. With 10 straight knockouts to his credit, 19-year-old Jack was already a legend in the making. If you had the job of writing a script for a movie about a boxer, you couldn't top the Jack Doyle story. With the looks of Rudolph Valentino, the voice of Count John McCormack, and the right hand of Jack Dempsey, he was God's gift to boxing. He had that charisma about him. He had that punch that everyone just wanted to see him land. There was uh, traffic jams from Marble Arch down to White City just to see him, the famous Jack Doyle. Every country looks for heroes because it lifts the national consciousness, and I think that's what Jack Doyle did for Ireland. He earned the adulation of the British, Irish, and American people. But he just didn't have that character that would allow him to sustain his success. Forty years on, Jack's life had become a cautionary tale of wasted talent and squandered millions. Another forgotten Irishman dying penniless on the streets of London. Come on, son, let's go. So where did it all go wrong for the gorgeous Gale? Four, two, three, four, five. I never think of being down. It's all in the mind. Up all the time. Never look down. I'll always find someone to buy me a drink. Never short of a good old time. Our cable and the car. Mr. Wales. Great friend of mine, David Windsor. 250 suits. Al Stanley, James Cagney and all the boys. Women by the dozen. Of course, there's qualified men a foul. That's how life goes. I was very, very young. I was interested in boxing myself. And when I found out I had an uncle who was a famous boxer, you know, it meant quite a lot to me then. And so I was always reading up about his career and looking at the photographs, things like that. This is Cottrell's Row, where the family house used to be. It's like in the heart of the holy ground, really. And their house was up there, somewhere around here. I don't know exactly. They were like tenement type houses, I believe. And as you can see, there's nothing there now. But that's exactly where the grandmother, the grandfather, Jack, my father, and all the brothers and sisters all lived there. The man we know today as Jack Doyle was born Joe Doyle in Cove, then Queenstown, in 1913. The second child of merchant seaman Michael and his wife Anastasia. Jack had a happy upbringing, but it was tough. Cove was the garrison town. Ireland was under British rule, and of course, Jack grew up uh, in that kind of atmosphere. It was tough, it was hard, you had to be able to fight to survive. Jack would have grown up during the First World War when Queenstown was exceptionally busy because it was one of the main centres in, in the war. And he would have had all of those elements that you get in a lot of Porsche towns, people really of all ranks and conditions living in the town. Michael Doyle, Jack's father, wanted to be a boxer himself, but he injured his leg in a fall from the rigging of a ship. He then obtained employment in a quarry and a fragment of splintered stone delighted him in the left eye. Once Jack was born, he entertained this great hope that his dream would be reborn. As the years passed, it seemed that Michael Doyle's dream was set to become reality. Fighting had come naturally to his son, especially when young Jack discovered that his right-hand punch could settle all arguments. Boys from other towns used to come, and he had a, quite a reputation. They'd throw down their coat in the road. N not a word was exchanged. Jack knew exactly what that meant. Always and without exception, he sent them crashing. They were hard days. You know? It was them working class areas, docks, you know, all them places, bread fighters, just like in Wales, South Wales, where the mines were. You had a boxing club on every pit head and all them, and that's where you, well, they all produced good light boxes in them days. Oh, what's the car? I'm Happy a nephew, Roger. nephew of Jack. My father was Bill. I don't know if you remember him Billy well. died, I died no one with. Yeah. Can you use your fists? Can I use my fists? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, I'm too old for that now. I can't take you on to them. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. What do you remember of Jack? I fought at him. Did you? And it happened very soon. We were all the best of pals, you see. I was in the back, filling bags of sports. 
And my brother came down the steps with a bloody nose. And he says, I want the money off a dial. And instead of giving me the money, he gave me a clatter. I said, I go up now and fix him. I went up, he says, I do the same to you. So <laughs> we snapped. And I knocked him out. It was a long time ago, yeah. A long time, but she said, no. Come to think of it, nearly a century ago. But times were bad, and you had to be tough to them to live. Yeah. He worked for my father because my father was a coal merchant at the time. That was the industry, if you like, for coal, you know, in those days. You'd get a shipment of coal in, and the likes of Jack now would shovel the coal into the butts, and the butts then would be taken down to the coal yards and shoveled off. Jack was always trying to get a bob here, a bob there, surviving, getting food for the family. It was a very busy little port. Jack would be shifting cases or collecting baggage for this one and that one, and he'd get a few shillings for it, and he walked, he walked hard. He was a tough man, tough man, good looking. And he went to play along with his, with his good looks and got away with it. He didn't just want to be known as the great champion of Queenstown, which is what he'd become. He wanted a wider fame. And so gradually built up this strength, this sheer size and confidence, of course. And then he came across a book by Jack Dempsey, How to Box. From that moment, his destiny was shaped. He was going to be a boxer. Everybody loved Jack Dempsey. He had a magic name because he was a fighting man. Real rough, tough. People have always had a grow for the fighting man. Dempsey was one of the most famous heavyweights in history. No science, no jabbing, no fainting. Just used to go in and wipe them out. Dempsey really fired his imagination and he was going to win the World Heavyweight Championship for Ireland. He lived his life from then on as if he was Jack Dempsey. In the early 1920s, Ireland was changing rapidly. The Irish Free State was set up. Queenstown had then become Cove and in, in, in one sense, it was a whole new era. At the same time, it, it didn't mean that suddenly everything was OK and that there were huge opportunities there. There really would have been not an enormous number of choices for somebody like Jack, with his background and with his education. The army was a traditional route out of poverty in garrison towns like Cove. At 16, he was too young to join the Irish forces, but like thousands of other young Irishmen, Jack was happy to take the king's shilling. An army would school him in boxing, and the British army seemed as good as any. He grew up as Joe Doyle, and uh, of course, he was Joe to all his friends, to his family, to everybody who knew him. But obviously, the spectre of Dempsey hung over him. It wasn't enough just to read about Jack Dempsey, just to hear about him. He wanted to become Jack Dempsey's alter ego. On the journey across to Pembroke to join the Irish Guards, a great transformation occurred. Goodbye, Joe Doyle. Hello, Jack Doyle. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Jack Doyle. Yes. Your Majesty, I've been honoured to Of course, how very nice, isn't it? Shake your hand. Yes. Delighted. Brilliant. And all the mix with the Irish Guards, all paddies, Bucky and Palace, right across there. See by the gates. Two hours on, four hours off. Full pack, full dress, full of whole lot, standing on, on guard outside the palace there, breaking to them in heart. I wouldn't do it today, I'll tell you that. Jack's idea of joining the army was for the sole reason of developing himself as a boxer. It gives a regiment such prestige to have a fighter who's able to win the Brigade Advance Championship or even an army title. And so somebody like Jack would have been cosseted and given extra rations, uh, all the facilities to enable him to reach the top. This was Joe Doyle, or Jack as we now know him, with an audience to play to. This was Jack Doyle developing into the star he was eventually destined to become. The problem was nobody could stand up to him. Whoever they put in front of him, he just knocked them out in the first round. 
fate lent a hand. Guardsman Doyle was stationed in Windsor, home not just to the royal family, but also to top boxing promoter Dan Sullivan and his champion fighter, Len Harvey. Dan Sullivan, basically, he was the main man in them days. And he said, we need sparring partners. There was one guy, like about six foot three or four, dark, wavy hair, beautiful looking guy. He came in, and it was Jack Doyle. They gloved him up, he got into the ring, and Harvey made a complete monkey out of him. Twisting him, turning him, placing him like a toy soldier, just making him a complete fool. But in his eagerness to put the young soldier in his place, Harvey's showboating had left him wide open. Bang! Overcoming that big dempsey right hand. He's hit Harvey with a right hand punch, and his old legs wobbled. So Jim Wick said, oh, you slipped there, didn't you, Len? He went, slip? He said, the bleeding guy's hit me with a punch. He said, I've never been hit so hard in my life. Sullivan's arrival on the scene was pivotal. Sullivan had the sway and the clout to get Jack right to the top, and Jack realised this. After just a year and a half in uniform, Sullivan brought his protégé out of the army and turned Jack professional. It was the first step on the road to heavyweight championship glory. The heavyweights was the glamour way, where the public just took to him and wanted to see them. If he could be an heavyweight champion, he would have a comfortable life. In them days in London, you could watch boxing seven days a week, twice on a Sunday. Sullivan wasted little time getting his latest recruit into the ring. Five fights, five wins in just four months. Jack was dispatching opponents as quickly as Sullivan could set them up living up to his title as the hottest property in sport. Sullivan realised that this was a boy who could supersede anything else that had ever happened in British boxing. He was a boy with the physique and the looks of a Valentino. He was going to be Sullivan's Valentino of the ring. This is Mr Dan Sullivan, the discoverer of Jack Doyle, Britain's latest heavyweight hope. And here is Jack Doyle. Now, Jack, show Pethys how you've been knocking out all the opponents inside of... Sullivan's plan from day one was not just to manufacture him as a fighter. He was going to be a glamour fighter. Women were going to flock to boxing to see him. He knew that Jack would transcend boxing. Blimey, he's knocked out the camera. He was a colourful character in a period in early flight when it was pretty dull. Mass unemployment, bad conditions and all that. The average man in the street the woman of the street wanted someone to give them a boost. He gave Ireland a whole new identity in the 30s. Her mother was in service in Dublin, and the postman came whistling up the path and said, we got a world champion in that fellow Doyle, I'm telling you. Doyle's sixth fight drew a crowd of over 17,000 fans eager to see Irish Jack, the Blarney boy, in action. He used to get into the ring in a bright silk dressing gown, take it off, green shorts, smile to the ladies, and blow kisses to them, and wink at those at the ringside. In them days, we never had pop stars as idols. Didn't have pop stars. We looked at sports people. Jack was one of the early ones that started like getting women coming around and sitting at ringside because he was a good-looking fellow. He was larger than life. He just had all these necessary ingredients that would captivate the public. He'd walk into a club and everybody would turn and the band leader would get him up sing a song and he'd sing Danny Boy or Irish Eyes are smiling and, and you couldn't invent a character like that. The moon through the valley I was 12 years old when the press started giving him publicity. Sweet voice, good looking, he got this knockout punch. And um, I became a fan of his. He was the golden boy in them days. There was society people flocking in their roses and Daimlers to see him. He was definitely a name that drew the crowd. Stephen Doyle 
Still only 18, the boy from Cove was now eager to experience all the delights his growing fame had placed on offer. Beautiful women, champagne, caviar, dancing at the Ritz. It was the beginning of a love affair with London that would last a lifetime. There's the old Dolceton now, boy. Please back some very happy memories. Many a time I staggered in here at four or five o'clock in the morning. I'll be around the corner of the nightclub. Good old days, women by the dozens. Ah, English, Scotch, Welsh, you name them. They were all there. He would have come from a culture which was quite restrictive in many ways, certainly from a religious point of view. And when he got an opportunity to kick off the traces, as it were, he did. Jack's eyes were open to this new world where titled women, fashionable women, gorgeous women, were actually throwing themselves at him. He couldn't believe it. Jack was experiencing hero worship on the grand scale. That's where the seeds of destruction were sown, because it, it turned Jack's head completely. When the Irish came in the beginning, they kept their heads down, lived on the job, ate off the shovel. But Jack joined the aristocracy. He'd be at Ascot, he'd be at the horses. They'd be fighting to have Doyle in the box. Because if you're with somebody that's famous and attractive, then you attract attention to yourself. They wanted him, they needed him. A lowly guardsman no more, Jack set about becoming a perfect English gent. He took a butler, a chauffeur, read the classics and learned to mask his Irish brogue. My father was probably the closest brother to Jack in age and everything else, uh, four years younger than Jack to the day, actually. Pretty much inseparable then, you know. I think he acted as his valet, really, looking after his clothes, because he had so many suits and shoes. He was famous for that. Here's a notable photograph, actually, in Sam Ritz. That's, that's a picture of my father's skin, but he was there with Jack. I think that was quite a rich man's club in those days, going there, in the 30s. They're old Sam Ritz, cocktail balls and the thing up half the night, the most what? Happy memories. Jack's first fight had earned him 50 pounds, a significant purse. But barely six months later, he was offered 750 pounds, about 20 grand today, to fight the talented Jack Pettifer, another unbeaten heavyweight. This was Jack's chance to prove himself a serious contender, but he had already become distracted by life outside the ring. Everything had come too easy for Jack. He knew that he was, a, he was something special. He knew that he transcended boxing. And he was hardly training. He thought training was for fools. Doyle believed in himself. He really believed he was, he was the coming white hope. And all he had to do was to land that right hand punch and finish the next fight. Tell me about the Jack Pettifer fight. Oh, who's the marvelous man? He was six feet seven, and believe it or not, I had a cold when I went in to meet him. Straight from the bell, Jack was in trouble. Used to finishing off opponents with his first punch, he realized now he'd a fight on his hands. Jack received a tremendous shellacking in the first round. Pettifer blasted him from pillar to post, almost knocked him out. The problem at Jack was that he was kind of knocking everyone out, so he's never actually learned to box. He had the big punch, he had the leveler, that was always going to save the day. But if you kind of don't have a plan B or plan C, you know, you're in a lot of trouble. Jack staggered back to his corner for the interval. Fortunately, he had a manager who wasn't averse to using one or two tricks of the trade. He produced a flask of brandy, tipped the contents down Jack's throat, slapped him around, he said, get out there and do your stuff. Second down, round two. Went out in blinding temper and smashed Pettifer to defeat. Bump, 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 Go right hander. Down he went. Jack had snatched a crucial victory from the jaws of defeat. The KO King was still in business. I am very happy to have won my fight with Pelifer, but owing to a very bad call, I would have done better in the first round. In a few days, I intend to resume training for my next fight. I hope it will be for the heavyweight championship of Great Britain, which I intend and hope to win. I think he was taken by the glamour of boxing, not realizing that it's not just getting into the ring, on big fight night and the crowd's cheering. He had the heart. I don't think Dial had the heart. He looked on boxing as a, as a way to make himself rich. Boxing gave Jack a lifestyle far removed from his childhood in Cove. 
He bought a house for his parents and lavished gifts on his friends. He denied himself few luxuries. 250 suits, 100 pairs of shoes, cars, massive bar bills, and all-night gambling sessions. Had Jack been English instead of Irish, he'd have had a bit of cop on. He'd have said, this isn't going to last. The Irish have got a built-in self-destruct. We don't live for tomorrow. <laughs> we'll, not even today, we live for yesterday. What a great day we had, you know, and, and you never think it's going to end. And it did seem then that nothing could halt Jack's inexorable rise. Outside the ring, he was marketed as a singing star, snapped up by Decca Records. Sullivan organised a tour of Great Britain to capitalise on his singing, which would also include a spot of sparring and boxing training, and chorus girls fanning him with, with towels. And uh, it was quite a sensuous thing for the 30s, but it worked. And of course, all these shows were sellouts. Money talks all languages. You could be the best boxer in the world, but if you don't sell tickets, you're no good to the promoter. If you have got a following, you'll get all the work you need. Jack's fame bought him his chance to make boxing history as the first Irishman to become British heavyweight champion. But win, lose or draw, Jack was set to receive a staggering £3,000 for the fight. 85,000 people packed the White City, causing a traffic jam in Piccadilly that night. Police were out, they nearly had to call in the army to control the crowd. And he was only 19 years of age and a novice. Back home in Ireland, the country waited to hear word of a famous win from across the water. In Cork, thousands of fans gathered outside the offices of the Examiner newspaper with its direct line to White City. Irish boxer fans really believed that finally we had a good heavyweight who might go places. Kind of the saviour of Irish boxing. But on this, the most important night of his life, Jack was physically incapable of fighting. What he had written off as flu months before was actually the early symptoms of venereal disease. Jack was battling syphilis. To get into the ring for a championship fight with an opponent as tough and experienced as Peterson, knowing you're not going to last, is something that no young man should have to contend with. Boxing, above all sports, okay. is really the ultimate soul kind of searching sport. You know, you can run, but you can't hide people screaming, the lights go on and expectations high. If in his own head he's not happy that he's capable to get in with a very experienced man like, like Peterson and, and fight him for a title, if he carries that into the ring, he's going to be in trouble. Jack went all out to end the fight as quickly as possible. But physically drained, his show-stopping right hand failed. He relied on that hit too much. Without that, he couldn't handle it. He had that terrific dig where he could put people out, but he couldn't take punishment. Jack began to foul, punching Peterson below the belt. Jack got in, he had a bit of a go, and he knew he was in a hide into nothing. He was going to get paid, so what was the easiest way to get out? And the low blows, you know, made a bit of sense. After some ten consecutive low punches, the referee stepped in. Dial threw away a whole career. He brought shame on Irish boxing, if you like. Because he just threw away a golden opportunity to become the first Irish boxer to win the British heavyweight title. This bright promise that had evoked the passions of Britain and Ireland had suddenly ground to a halt. Jack's desperation to end the fight and walk away with his money proved a terrible mistake. The authorities decided to make an example of him. He was banned from boxing for six months. Even worse, his fee was confiscated. In just 213 seconds, Doyle's dream of becoming the Irish Jack Dempsey lay in ruins.
historic victory. Michael Johnson is home. The sense of anticipation is almost unbearable. in front in the European Championship final. Tipo Inzaghi, a seventh Champions League for Milan. Robbie Keane, there you are. We're on the way. Oh, what about that? Oh, the score. Sure. And wins the goal. Club. Introducing not the usual Jagger. Two fellows there. Don't look now, right? But I think that's him over there. I saw him, Blake. I'm not messing with you. Yeah, you did, yeah. I'm telling you now, the truth is out there. Nice shot, Dodo. Hello, sugar. How you doing, baby? I'm back. Okay, sugar. You're up next. <laughs> Smithings, not the usual. Plan a great day out. Visit McElhenney's Vat Boy Winter Sale, where prices are greatly reduced on all our ladies' fashion and bridal collections. McElhenney's Vat Boy Sale starts Wednesday, January the 2nd at 9 a.m. Don't miss it. You won't have to think twice. She's pure as New York snow. Nice and Easy transforms your hair color with an expert blend of subtle tones for beautiful, natural-looking hair color. It's a small change to your hair that makes a big change to your head. So be a shade braver. Nice and Easy, be a shade braver. One hundred thousand leather sofas, one hundred million euros to be saved at over one hundred stores. Now that's a sale, and it's now on at Land of Leather. Save nine hundred on these three and two seaters, now only eight nine nine the pair. Save two thousand on these three and two seater recliners and recliner chair, now only thirteen nine nine the lot. Now that's a sale. Now on at a Land of Leather store near you. New store at Galway. When you're asleep, your cigarette cravings pack up too. That's why Nicorette patches are designed only to be worn while you're awake. So you can bin them at bedtime. And give your body a break from additional nighttime nicotine. Don't think cigarette. Think Nicorette. Visit T.C. Matthews' absolutely fabulous showrooms. The winter sale is now on with rather large reductions and free underlay on all stock rolls. T.C. Matthews' carpets, Walkinstown, Lucan, Narvan and Dunleer. Great sale. I oh, know. It's our best ever. Yeah, it's not surprising with these deals. You're right there. P.C. World. P.C. World. The best of both worlds. Eighty years after his heyday, there is still a buzz in Cove about local boy Jack Doyle, fighter, singer and Lothario. The story of Jack Doyle is so totally off the wall. I mean, it's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale with booze and women and shitloads of money. He was our hero. We had so many family walking in England. You know, they write in, I met Jack Doyle here, I saw Jack Doyle there. But, you know, legend. The story gets better and better. He was a, a name we all grew up with. He left Cove without a farthing, and he had a million, blew a million, and uh, had all these gorgeous women. 
I was very young when I met him, but um, you'd get that about him. He's very suave, very gentlemanly, you know. And uh, he'd sort of take over the whole room, wouldn't he? Completely. You know, completely. you'd walk into the pub to meet and he'd be the, the centre of attraction sort of thing, you know. He looked the part, he acted the part, and he became the part of this suave, fabulous man. It was five years since Jack Doyle had left Cove to find his fortune as a boxer. In that time, he'd achieved wealth and fame, though reckless womanising and drinking brought notoriety. His bid to become British heavyweight champion had ended in disgrace and a six-month ban from boxing. But back in Ireland, Jack was a hero. He would have been a celebrity. In a sense, what he had done would have been the dream of a great many people, to go away, make money, and come back. For Jack to come back with all that money in, in a comparatively short period of time would have been a real sensation. Five years before this picture was taken, he would have been shoveling coal or carrying luggage up to the Commodore Hotel in Cove, you know, and there he is dressed up in a tuxedo for his 21st birthday in the Imperial Hotel. Jack's 21st birthday party was a society event on a scale rarely witnessed in Ireland. 300 guests wined and dined in fine Italian style, all paid for by Jack. He did something in the 1930s that hadn't been seen before, especially in Ireland, I suppose. He was probably one of the first sportsmen in Ireland to do that sort of thing, make so much money and, and mix with the people that he did mix. Suspended from boxing, Jack needed to find other ways to use his talents and the movies came calling. When we made McGlaskey the Sea Rover, we brought heavyweight Jack Doyle from the ring to the screen to give the film the right amount of... Jack was offered a £10,000 three-picture deal to play McGlusky, a popular action hero who was a combination of Tarzan and James Bond. His future outside of the ring seemed assured. The world was going through a very deep depression most of the 30s, and that's why at those times so many people went to the movie theaters, because they wanted to escape and forget their problems. They were turning out more and more action pictures, so if you could just say a few lines, you could get on and off the horse, and if you could, you know, do a fight scene, okay, that's all you needed. Jack believed his face would be his fortune, and with McGlusky in the can, he abandoned England to try his luck in Hollywood. Hollywood was a wonderful place for my day. With Earl Flanley and all, and uh, James Cagney and all the boys just then. He was seen everywhere. He was a singer, he looked good, he was a boxer, he had this background from Ireland, so there's a lot of public sentiment on his side, and everyone thought he was the hot thing coming. He knew how to play the game. He'd walk in the door. Hi, chaps. Camera one, spotlight, you know. He would take over. Jack's first major relationship with a woman in the United States was with the movie star Judith Allen. Jack met her and fell immediately in love with her. An uncharitable view might suggest it was her money that he fell in love with. But Judith was captivated by him. I loved his voice. I thought he had a magnificent voice. And you know, he told me that he would never sing Mapushla to anybody else for the rest of his life. <sighs> Those were nice days. It was a whirlwind romance, and the couple soon married in Mexico. The boy from Cove was living the American dream. A sports celebrity came to town, they'd be in vogue for a while. Everybody would want to have them to their parties because it was a novelty. And as long as you minded your manners or were entertaining or charming, then for a while you'd be feted by the stars of Hollywood. With Judith's movie career providing the cash, Jack began to enjoy the high life. His taste for excess increased, gambling away thousands of dollars, parting at the Coconut Grove, crossing swords with real Hollywood A-listers. He got flirtatious, as the story goes, with Carol Lombard, and didn't mind that this was offending Clark Gable, and it led to a little fisticuff between the two, so to speak. In comes Gable, marvelous. Come outside, he says, come outside. Well, of course, what could I do? Bump, 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 down he went. So I mean, lads? Never ended up in the books or in the court records, but it did help endear him to the A-list crowd. 
if a big star like Clark Gable has his mitts, so to speak, on a woman, then it wasn't cricket for somebody who wasn't on the A-list to come in and try to grab her. Jack had committed the ultimate faux pas. Worse was to come. Word came from England that McGlosky, the sea rover, had sunk without trace at the box office. The producers passed on his contract. Jack's Hollywood days were numbered. Some of the studios did do screen tests, but they discovered what they had discovered in England, that while he looked good on camera, he was very wooden and wouldn't spend much time disciplining himself to learn how to act. Didn't want to give up his drinking, didn't want to give up his parting or his womanizing, so he wore out his welcome. It's none other than Jack Doyle who confronts the camera. Through with America, the Irish heavyweight himself tells us his hopes of a comeback in the ring. One of the greatest mistakes of my life was to go to Hollywood. So I hope that in my future ring appearances, I shall attain what I've always wanted to do, and that is to win the heavyweight championship of Great Britain for my own sake. And, um, but in reality, 23-year-old Jack's life was beginning to unravel. He had returned alone to England with his marriage to Judith on the rocks. America had been an expensive mistake. His drinking, hell-raising and heavy gambling had cost him a movie career and put him massively in debt. He was skinned, and so he knew he had to fight again. He cabled Dan Sullivan, saying, get me a fight as soon as you can. This was music to Sullivan's ears. He got him a huge offer to go back and fight King Leminski, a tough American fighter. At first, Jack trained diligently for his return to the British ring, but it wasn't long before old habits returned. Jack never let marriage get in the way of, an, <laughs> of a fling with a beautiful woman or a rich woman. Judith was hearing from fellow actresses on the grapevine with Jack, with Beryl Markham, the first one to fly the Atlantic solo east to west, Libby Holman Reynolds of the giant Reynolds Tobacco Company, and then, of course, came the real bombshell, the entry into his life of Delphine Dodge. Delphine Dodge was a very, very wealthy heiress. She came from the Dodge Carr family. She was about 12 years older than he was, and she wasn't comparable to Judith, but she had something Judith didn't have, lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Delphine gave him 5,000 pounds for his 24th birthday, settled his gambling debts. Her money was Jack's. She was being a fool, but uh, she was in love, and she had the money, millions and millions and millions and millions. Eventually, Judith could take no more of Jack's behavior. She responded with a one-word telegram. Jack's two-year marriage was over. This was the most improbable build-up to a fight ever in the history of boxing. Here you've got him allegedly training to fight the ferocious King Levinsky, and he's shacking up with Delphi. For his many fans, Jack's colorful private life was as big a draw as his sporting ability. 11,000 turned up to Wembley to see the international playboy in action. Disaster struck early on. Jack broke a bone in his famous right hand. But remarkably, with the odds stacked against him, he began to box. For the first time in years, Jack fought like a true champion, and the world saw a glimpse of the original Jack Doll. Amazingly, he beat King Levinsky. He went 12 rounds to do it. I mean, you couldn't make this up. Offers for him to continue as a boxer came flooding in. Sullivan had a £6,000 offer for him to fight Tommy Farr. But he, he wasn't interested. Not now that he had Delphine. That was his shining star. She was going to buy this huge property out in the West San Fernando Valley and set up a big estate for him. They're going to have a wonderful life. Once, of course, she got divorced. The Dodge family didn't instantly recognize Jack as a gold digger. The alarm bell started ringing when Delphine and Jack announced they were to marry. Mrs. Dodge, the multimillionaire, took her back by force. One fellow had a gun up there in my head. He said, if you don't leave her alone, boy, you've had it. And by gosh, I had to too. He was paid $10,000 to keep his mouth shut, and that was the end of that romance. So now Jack has lost his wife and has lost his meal ticket. But that didn't faze him because he loved to play around, loved to have a good time, and let tomorrow take care of itself. The first time I met Jack, I was at the Windmill Theatre singing, and uh, standing there was this six foot four inch man, the great Jack Doyle. 
I shook his hand, says, hello, Jack, how are you? He said, I'm fine, and we got talking. We left the windmill, 20 or 30 people, all hangers on and drinking buddies, and they all sat down and had a four course meal, and Jack paid for the lot. I've got it all here in this scrapbook. I'll bring it over here to the table. There he is, the man himself, the great Jack Doyle. At that time, he was still in the money, but I sensed that he was on a downward slope because the booze had started to take over. I said to him, look, you're going to finish up a bum if you carry on like this. And he started laughing. He said, I've lived 10 lifetimes to the average guy. I am a man among men. But by the end of the 30s, Jack's self-destructive lifestyle had caught up on him. The dodge payoff had run out. His gambling debts were mounting, and once more, he was treated for syphilis. Seeking ready cash, he agreed to fight British champion boxer Eddie Phillips. He went into the ring there, half sloshed, according to Tim Doyle. When Sullivan had popped out to witness the bandaging of Eddie Phillips, Jack took this half bottle of brandy and knocked, knocked it all back. Overweight and unfit, Jack was unrecognisable from the KO King who had blasted onto the boxing scene just six years earlier. He let himself down, really, you know, he, he didn't do justice to himself. He hadn't trained probably, he did the bottle a bit too much, you know, and, and it was just a shame. During the first bout, Jack fell out of the ring, knocking himself out. The return bout was over in 144 seconds. At only 25 years of age, Jack Doyle was washed up. He would never box competitively again. Ridiculed by the press, Jack escaped England and headed for the States. But America now had little time for Jack Doyle. Without a visa, on arrival, he was thrown into jail. What should happen but another beautiful woman should appear in his life. The bombshell Movita. She'd appeared in Flying Down to Rio, she'd appeared in Mutiny on the Bounty with Gable, and she was being squired by the mysterious Howard Hughes. Peter ditched Howard Hughes to meet Jack Doyle because she'd seen a picture of him in jail detained by the custom officials, and that appealed to her nature. He was gorgeous. You could help but falling in love with him. He did all the right things. He was strong, he was sensitive, and uh, very romantic. Down in Mexico in 1939, Jack does it again. He gets married to Movita. But no one will sponsor him here now for either boxing or for Hollywood. So he went back to England, and Movita, being the dutiful wife, decided she would abandon Hollywood, and she followed over after him. Jack and Movita returned to an England at war, a country that needed a touch of glamour more than ever. London took to Jack and Movita, Big Jack, Little Movita. They were mobbed wherever they went, Burton and Taylor of their day. With Movita by his side, Jack's future never looked brighter. Together, they devised a stage show to capitalise on his renewed popularity. They were singing, they were doubling up in nightclubs, they were earning a fortune. And they were entertaining people in hospital, entertaining people in factories, down in the subways. They were doing their part for the war effort. The glamorous couple then took their show to Ireland. Their arrival caused a major stir, an antidote to the austerity of the emergency. They were so popular they sold out the Theatre Royal for weeks on end, matinees, evening performances. Ireland was intoxicated by Jack and Movita, and they drunk in every drop. Uh, 4,000 people a show. Of course, it was one of the biggest theatres in the Europe at the time, I believe. It was marvellous. Chock-a-block. At six chorus girls, you know, Jack coming out. I'll take you home again. You can't well, a blight. It was beautiful. I saw him in Dublin with Movita, walking down O'Connell Street. By the time he got to the end of O'Connell Street, there was two or three hundred people just following him along. 
himself a more beat and nodded like the queen to, to the subjects. Movita loved it and so did Jack, but that self-destruct button was always very, very close to Jack. When Licker took over, things got a little bit, shall we say, misty. When he was in his cups, he felt on top of the world, and that got away with him. I once said to him, you know, you're a big man, but your brains have left you when you start knocking women about. Something would come over him, and I guess uh, he turned it all on me. I never knew when this was going to, to turn into this horrible human being. He'd draw blood and he'd knock her out with one slap. You know, she was absolutely petrified of him. One Christmas day, the porter told her, oh, Mr. Doyle's here. And so, of course, she rushed down to embrace Jack and she opened the taxi door. And Jack was in a state of compromise with a woman. He dragged Movita by her hair back into the flat and knocked her unconscious. She miscarried. She was, at the time, expecting a baby. so afraid of him and I feel so sorry for him and I didn't blame him but at the same time I knew I just had to get out from his earliest days in Cove gambling drinking and violence had been part of Jack's life by the age of 29 he had earned and spent a fortune and a decade of alcohol abuse had affected him physically and mentally with Movita gone Life soon got bad for Jack. Publicly, he still swaggered down O'Connell Street, turning heads, his charm intact. But by the late 40s, Jack was effectively homeless, a time sleeping rough in the back of a taxi. But for the last time, the kindness of a woman would offer him salvation. He bumped into Nancy Kyo on O'Connell Street. She would be his partner for the next 30 years. She was a very pretty girl, inclined to be a little shy. I could see that she had quite strong feelings for Jack. I very much liked her, very much. He'd keep her happy, take her out for dinner and that type. She wasn't a drinking girl, but she idolised Jack. You know, take care of his clothes and the food was ready if he was coming over. And he knew he had a good thing there, I'd say. Nancy had brought him back from the brink, but Jack wanted more. He yearned again for the love of the crowd. In 1949, the couple moved to England, and Jack attempted one final return to the ring, this time as a wrestler, titling himself the gorgeous Gale. He'll win the heavyweight championship of the world. There was something to do. Get the crowds behind him. He loved the crowds. He played to the gallery, always. But it's always said that if a boxer goes into wrestling, it's the end. The crowd that had been so loyal in the past had grown weary of Jack Doyle. Though only 36 years old, his body was bloated and battered from abuse, a shadow of the sporting adonis of his youth. For the first time in his career, Jack was booed and jeered. Doyle's doing nothing. Tony's bewildered. And the ref announces Doyle has retired with a broken rib. In his glory days of the 1930s, Jack had earned hundreds of thousands of pounds, a fortune worth millions today. But by the 50s, he had lost it all. While Nancy worked as a waitress, Jack idled his time alone in their bedsit. He'd spend hours on his own in the flat, just sitting there playing patience over and over again and chain smoking. This is lovely to room. I enjoy myself here. Play a game of patience now and again. Have a bottle of beer across the road to my local pub, go to the bookies. What's wrong with that? It's a great old life. Can't beat it. When I was in my teens, we went up to see him in um, one of the pubs up in, in London, and um, I think he gave us a song from the bar there. He just liked uh, mixing with his, his friends and going out for a drink and talking the old times. By 1960, 
Jack Doyle was just another name from the past. Yet, in his London manner of Notting Hill, the gorgeous Gale was still a celebrity of sorts. Everybody knew Jack round here, everybody. He stood out, didn't they? I mean, he must have been six foot four. Easy. And he used to have all his hair brill, brill cream back. Immaculate, absolutely immaculate. And he used to come in every day and buy a red carnation. That would remind you now of the Lord Mayor of the town, if you like. Some people walk into a place and people take no notice of them. But when Jack walked into a place, it was his presence it was felt. Of course, everything at that stage revolved around the bear. He'd never be the first into the pub because if the pub had just opened, there was nobody in there to buy him a drink. So he would wait until it was warm. And then I'd say, hello, Jack, how did you do? And he'd say, fine old chap, wonderful old boy. I'll always find someone here to buy me a drink. So I'm, <laughs> you know, never, never short of a good old time. Then, of course, I'd bob across now and then to the bookmakers, put on a bet. It used to be hundreds and thousands in the old days. Now it's a few quid now here and there, you know. Every day, a few bob. Wherever Jack was, he was the center of attention. And I think that's what drove him on. And he could guarantee being the center of attention in the sort of places that uh, he liked to be. Dog racing, pubs, clubs, that sort of thing. There was a particular night we were at the White City and uh, Jack obviously wasn't with his normal friends and uh, caught sight of us and said to us, come and have a drink. People did try and avoid Jack later in his life, I'm afraid. He owed money and he borrowed money. So what you did then was sort of hide around the corner when you were at the dogs and, oh, there's Jack, oh, let's disappear around the corner. I know it's a bit unkind to say these things, but you never borrowed it. You just used to say, give us a tenner, give us 20 quid, and that's it. Jack had spent decades regaling friends and fans with tales of old glories for the price of a drink. But by the 70s, that charm had worn thin. By this time, the seed had set into my mind that he was trouble. Because when he got a few drinks in him, he became uncontrollable. One day I saw Nancy and she had a slight black eye. And I said to him, there's no need to do that sort of thing. A man of your size. There was a resentment to his treatment of Nancy. He gave Nancy a raw deal, you know, like, I mean, she loved him dearly and uh, really looked after him. And when he was stuck and nowhere else to go, he'd go back to Nancy. One morning, she just got up and left, and that really was the end of Jack Doyle. All throughout his remarkable highs and lows, Jack had relied on friends and lovers to keep him together. Now, he had only himself to fall back on, and that wasn't enough. Well, he was sleeping in doorways. People would find him and take him home and clean him up. But when you sleep in a doorway, there's no wall downstairs. There's no basement to go. You have hit it. That is it. Jack spent two years living on the streets of London. Late in 1978, he made the papers one last time when he collapsed and was brought to hospital. This is the last ever photograph of the famous Jack Doyle. The next thing, Jack signed himself out of the hospital. I was sitting on the train coming home from work, opened the evening standard, and uh, there was the headline, Jack Doyle found dead. When I read it, that he died in some back street, and I thought to myself, how sad. There was the golden boy. It was cirrhosis of the liver that killed Jack. He was 65 years old. His body lay unclaimed in St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. Just another homeless Irishman lost in London. We thought he was going to be buried in the pauper's grave in England. So we said, we couldn't let that happen. We decided here in Cove that we'd do work 
horse to get him back to his native side. A committee of townspeople combined with the family and the London Ex-Boxers Association to bring home their favourite son. It really was a big day, the actual day of the funeral. There were so many people around. Every place we were, there were lots of people out on the streets. And especially as we hit Cork, and especially into Cove here, just people everywhere. Like so many others before and since, Jack Doyle left Ireland to seek a better life. Jack found his fortune and promptly lost it. But still in Cove, there was a welcome for their prodigal son. The cortege was led on the mile-long journey to the cemetery outside the town by a local... It wasn't bike. just the older sector. Everybody turned up, really, you know. So it was a great send-off to a great man. A pair of boxing gloves For a few crazy years in the 30s, Jack Doyle was an international superstar. But he failed to fulfill his youthful promise, instead preferring the high life to the hard road. Yet that is part of his enduring appeal. Jack was perhaps the first modern celebrity, famous simply for being famous. <laughs> there you are. I have no regrets. Couldn't care less. Do the same again. Good luck. Good luck, boy. I'll start it. Far-flung destinations, the boys are back in town and how low can you go over on too soon? The Super Value Price Promise. 